So Shelly Morosco, you are a financial ninja, <laughs> may I say, <laughs> wanted to chat with you for Financial Wellness Month and uh, talk a bit about what you're seeing for 2024. I know the big part of the conversation has been interest rates. So start there. <laughs> what are you seeing in your, your crystal ball? If you're feeling a little whiplash around interest rates, you're not alone, Felina. Yeah. Uh, we went from record low, in fact, 0% interest rates as far as what the Federal Reserve is setting during COVID, which obviously they did to really try to keep money flowing within the economy. And then when inflation heated up a couple of years ago, the Fed went very strongly the other way. In fact, they've never raised rates that fast since like the 80s. Um I like to liken it to like a, a hose, maybe because my son leaves the hose out in our driveway all the time. <laughs> Basically, you know, when the hose is flowing nicely, you've got enough water going into your economy to um, keep interest rates reasonable for people that are borrowing money, um, keep enough money flowing for companies to invest in their resources and all is good. You know, during COVID, they really turned the hose on full blast and then realized that they may have gone a little too far and, and basically put a huge wrench in that hose about two years ago. Um, so we went from 0% interest rates up to where we are now, which is 5.5%. The good news is that since the meeting in December, when the Federal Reserve gathered, there's there are um, a lot of points being made and even some meeting notes that allude to maybe three points of interest rate drops this year, three quarter point drops. Um, so although we never know for sure where interest rates are going to land because things can change, of course, uh, it is quite likely that the Fed is going to back away. They're going to at least keep rates where they are and perhaps even bring us back down to somewhere between three and a half to four percent this year. Yeah. So that'll bode well for for everything in the economy with respect to borrowing, you know, getting mortgages, car loans, um, even the the types of um, interest rate charges that are happening on credit cards right now, these are at an all time high. Yeah, absolutely. But let's remind people we've been here before, right? <laughs> I think everybody's freaking out about interest rates. I'm like, you know, I, I refinanced my house probably 15 years ago at like five and change, right? And so <laughs> I yeah. think we have a short memory. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is a relative thinking. The last 20 years, we've seen record low interest rates. People that were around in the 80s are still saying, this is really nothing. We used to have to like borrow at 10 to 15% on loans for cars and houses. So my older clients definitely are not quite as concerned as I would say younger clients. Yeah. And I would also say that um, this whole increase in interest rates has had more of an adverse effect on younger families and people and poor families that have to do a lot more borrowing to meet, um, to make ends meet basically. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about the market, right? Yeah. We talked about interest rates and um, kind of, I think the, 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 maybe it's the older thought around uh, interest rates and the stock market, but given that interest rates are high, not, you know, we've been, like you said, 10, 15%, but I know I have some money in uh, a wealth front account that's paying me 5% interest right now. Yes, it's yes. Like, this is interesting. So I have yes. a choice. You so know. let's talk about the plus side of higher interest rates. I yeah. mean, it feels at times frustrating, especially if you're trying to borrow. Um, on the other hand, you can now get decent interest in a savings account, a money market account, CDs, and bonds, although bonds were really negatively affected these last two years by the rapid increase in rates, now bonds actually show a very promising annual return, you know, for the foreseeable future as the Fed keeps rates at this level. Um, I think it's Vanguard that has actually been kind of cheering for the fact that we're back to a sound money management situation, um, meaning that, you know, rates are higher. So it promotes saving. It promotes 
um, the ability to park money in guaranteed interest rate types of accounts that give people a place to put that money where they're going to need it for whatever their short-term goals might be. Yep. The other big plus is that if we get hit again with some sort of stress on our economy, like another COVID, you know, another housing crisis, hopefully we don't see those kinds of things come along. But but if it does, and, and when it does, because inevitably something comes along, the Fed now has a lever to to lower rates to help with that kind of environment. Yeah. So I, I would say those are the two biggest pluses um, and definitely a great environment now to be to be put parking money in savings accounts, money markets, CDs, and, and even bonds. Yeah. And I think it's important for folks to look outside the box of their bank, right? I bank with Wells Fargo and they're giving me like a half a percent, but yeah, yeah. like yeah. I said, Wealthfront and even, <laughs> um, even Robin Hood, <laughs> the trading platform, right? Yeah. Um, is giving over 5%. So look around and that's completely liquid. That's not a money market account. That is, that is just money I can pull out tomorrow. Yep. Um, bankrate.com is where I go to see all the different rate options. You know, I'm sure there's stuff that's not listed there, but on bankrate.com, you can search up, you know, best rates on money markets, CDs, and get a, get at least a good sense of what the landscape is and what you should be expecting. And you're absolutely correct. The big banks are not in the business of giving good interest rates. So when you look at the big Wells Fargo, B of A, Chase, this is the last place you want to have a bunch of cash parked right now. I mean, you might need to keep enough to pay your bills, but it really behooves you to find one other, at least one other great place where you can get at least four to five percent interest right now. Yeah, absolutely. OK, let's talk about the market. I keep hearing rumors that uh, it's going to go on a tear this year. <laughs> <laughs> what's your what's your uh, expert opinion? <laughs> um, I mean, I hope it's kind of a boring year from that <laughs> standpoint. Like the interest rate whiplash, we've had stock market and bond market whiplash. You know, 2022, we saw 25% drop in the S&P, bonds were down significantly. And in 2023, we've gone strongly the other way. Uh, the S&P, what, finished up, I think about 20, uh, 28% for the year. Um, so... Where we go from here is, again, something that no one knows for sure. Yeah. Um, my pulse on things, you know, gathering information like I do from Vanguard, Chase, Schwab, all the different sources I, I like to go to, is that we should expect things to continue to be positive in stocks. Um, and when I say stocks, I mean U.S. and international and emerging. Right now, the pulse is that emerging markets probably has the best room to boom in this next year ahead. But all three categories, U.S., international developed, even emerging, are showing, you know, most people are predicting somewhere between 6 to 8% positive return this year. Again, predictions... <laughs> can get you into trouble. We never know for sure. A lot of the stuff that throws the stock market sideways are unexpected um, black swan type moments. Um, but the pulse right now is that we should expect decent returns in stocks. And also, like I was alluding to earlier, in bonds. You know, they see actually for bonds and bond funds this year a similar a similar situation, maybe a little bit lower, but still look to five to 6% return in your bonds and bond funds. And that's a lot easier for us to, to estimate because it is driven largely by what the interest rates are on what bonds are paying right now. So if things continue to hold like they are, there's really good chance you're going to get nice returns in your bonds as well. And when you look at risk adjusted return, meaning if I want to stay a little bit more conservative and get that, you know, 6% return, you're from a risk return perspective, you're more likely to get that in the bond funds at this stage. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it comes down to, if I can, you know, just speaking for myself, if I have 5% guaranteed in liquid, yeah. right. I mean, I can sell off stock, right. But you yeah. know, if I'm in a, you know, uh, <clears throat> SEP IRA or something like that, it's harder to sell that that uh, that stock. So it is interesting and it'll be interesting to see 
again, what the Fed does, everybody's on pins and needles every time <laughs> they come out and uh, talk about interest rates. But uh, it, yeah. it's interesting to me that the stock market is still you know, projected to be in that growth stage, given interest rates being so high. Have we seen that historically before? I mean, a lot of times- A lot of people were forecasting a recession last year, yeah. because usually when rates get raised this dramatically, it, it's really hard for the, the overall economy to not slip into recession. And we went from everybody predicting a recession last year to then, I know Schwab called it a rolling recession. Certain sectors were feeling the pain. And, you know, a lot of people are saying, it looks like we might have avoided it, but they're not saying all bets are off. You know, they're saying there's still that slight chance that that the economy is going to lag and start to feel it this year. The, the underlying factor that's really helping is the resilience of the U.S. consumer. I mean, it's... Good. And maybe sometimes it's not great, depending on who you are. I continue I to it. shop and buy everything that you want and travel and eat out and all these things, even if, if your credit card bill interest rate is a little bit higher. It does catch up after a while. I heard a phrase uh, the other day, doom spending. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we're all doom spending right now. <laughs> yeah. And I, I guess I should also point out, you know, even though it's great, interest rates are higher and CDs, money markets and bonds are giving us a better risk adjusted return for money that you still think is parked somewhere that you're not going to touch for at least five to 10 years, you know, you're more likely still to get that higher expected return out of stocks. So while short term goals you want to have lined up with money that's in these safer type of accounts and investment options, stuff for retirement, if you're looking at retirement 20 years out, or even money you're not pulling out for at least, you know, five to 10 years or further out, still makes sense to keep in, in the stock market, despite the fact that it does have, you know, more chance for volatility. Yep. It also has that greater chance for growth. I mean, it it still is the case that we expect stocks over time to return somewhere between nine and 10%. Yeah, Absolutely. So Shelley, if somebody is thinking about their financial wellness in 2024 and they want to consult with somebody, talk about how you work um, and the difference in how you work from some other advisors. Sure. Um, anytime, you know, friends or family or whatever looking for a financial advisor, I, I strongly encourage them to look for somebody that's a certified financial planner. This is still kind of the gold standard in our industry. And the reason for that is because anybody wearing the CFP credential that's done the schooling, passed the board exam, worked for at least a couple of years in the industry, in addition, has to honor your, your, um, your situation with a fiduciary hat on, meaning your interest first all times is really, really important. Um, the industry has evolved over time and you know, back in the 80s and 90s, CFP wasn't really as much of a thing. And it was very much more of a sales situation that you were facing with your broker. Uh, these days, there's there's plenty of people out there that have the CFP credential. So I, I, do, I do urge people to look for that. And, and I have that credential as well as the employee in my, in my company. And we work really hard to honor clients' best interests. Um, another great credential is looking for an RIA, a registered investment advisor, because this type of investment advisor, even if they're not CFPs, they also are held to the fiduciary standard. So if you find someone in business that's got the CFP and the RIA, like they, they have to honor your best interests and they are held accountable to the CFP board as well as the SEC or, or the state board. Um, to honor your best interests. So those are the best kind of people to be working with. You know, you want to know that you're getting really presented great advice as opposed to a, a great sales pitch. Yeah. And then talk about the difference between fee only advisors. Sure. So that's another thing that's changed a lot. You know, back in the day, you were really all brokers, people encouraging financial trades, essentially were getting paid on commissions. Um, over the years, we're really lucky because now not only can you get mutual funds at really low fees, now your advisors are compensated by charging you a very hopefully transparent advisory fee. So fee only advisors are only getting compensated by what they present to you as your fee. 
Some of those fee only advisors will charge a fixed rate. You know, they'll say it's a few thousand dollars a year or a couple hundred bucks a month or whatever that might be. Um, and some of them, fee, the fee only advisors will charge you a percentage of the assets managed. But one way or the other, you have complete awareness by the contract you enter and you know, the hopefully reports they send you each quarter that show you what those fees are that you're paying. Uh, the other type of situation is, um, you know, there's the fee-based advisors that will be also presenting you a fee, but they also are getting paid on commission somewhere. And it could be by the mutual funds they sell or the insurance products that they sell. So a fee-based advisor will kind of do both. They'll actually charge you some sort of fixed fee or percentage of assets managed and in addition, there may be compensation to them through commissions on the products that they're encouraging you to enter. Um, and then the third tier, I guess, is the person that's just getting paid on commissions. And they're typically in the category of broker and often these days, mostly putting, you know, going to be selling insurance and then mutual funds that have um, load fees on them. That's the kind of advisor that I would generally try to avoid because if they're getting uh, compensated a certain way, that's going to cloud their advice a little bit. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Makes sense. Okay. So is there an option, Shelly, if somebody said, hey, I just want to engage with somebody once, help me build out a plan and yeah. then, you know, kind of point me in the right direction, coach me, so to speak. Is that is that something that that yeah, exists. <laughs> yes, and that is something we offer. And I and there are most in most cases the the CFP type firms that will offer that as well. And you know, in our business, we call it hourly consulting. I think that's kind of the typical way that it'll be presented. And then it's typically like an hour, uh, an hourly fee, and they'll tell you up front the number of hours that they would need to put together the project they're working on for you. So there is definitely a fair amount of CFPs that are also project-based in the kind of work that they do. Okay. That's that's a great way to get to know somebody. You know, I will have prospects that come to me and they're a little, you know, maybe they got referred, but they're a little unsure. And I'll say, let's start with hourly consulting, you know, get a sense of what we do, um, get a sense of what you might learn through the hourly consulting process. And then you can uh, obviously change course later and work with us or whoever it is you're, you're hiring on a longer term. Thanks. Awesome. Well, Shelly, thank you so much for your time and wisdom. If folks want to find you, what's the best place for them to go? Yeah, I mean, they can definitely go to our website is the easiest thing, wealthrisefp.com um, or Google search Shelly Morosco, M-U-R-A-S-K-O. You'll find all of our contact information there um, and an email, phone call, whatever it is. We're, we're definitely there for you. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Felina. I appreciate the opportunity. It's always a pleasure.